Hello, I'm Zonal Fit and welcome to another video on the TechQuest. Today I'm going to be taking a look at a processor that hasn't actually seen much coverage. I'm going to be taking a look at the Intel Core i5 14400F. But first, a little backstory. I capture a lot of footage in the process of recording all of these videos and to that end I use a variety of tools to do this, sometimes software related but more often than not hardware related. There's a lot of this stuff and as a result I have a separate room in my home where I do all of my video capture and editing as there's simply so much equipment I need to use that it is impractical for me to use my daily drive Horizon where I sit and relax at night to a game or two with my family. And this is where my other PC comes in. I usually chop and change this all the time although the components have been more consistent of late as I found some that will still meet my needs in terms of performance while remaining conscious of the price. I've been using a Core i3 14100F for the past couple of months and it's actually an excellent processor but I wanted a little more performance. I'm reviewing the i5 14400F today but this is going to be a processor that I will be keeping hold of and using daily for as long as it's going to meet my needs. It's not just a processor it's my processor on hardware that I use day in, day out. It's a personal review because I use it in almost everything I do and the 14400F is an integral part of that. Anyway, Let's get started. The Core i5-14400F is a 14th gen Intel processor based on the LGA1700 socket. Featuring a total of 10 cores and 16 threads, the 14400F is one of Intel's newer generation CPUs that features a variety of cores, similar to how mobile phones work. Of those 10 cores, 6 are performance cores with hyperthreading, clocked in at a base 2.5GHz and going all the way up to a whopping 4.7GHz under ideal conditions. These are the cores that your games will use, and matter the most for high performance computing and gaming. In addition to these cores, the 14400F also has efficiency cores. These are clocked slower and use much less power than the performance cores, with both benefits and downsides to that. These efficiency cores are clocked in at 1.8 GHz, but will boost under certain conditions up to a respectable 3.5 GHz. These aren't gaming cores, and they're designed for when your PC is in a low power state, such as web browsing, to take on the lightweight tasks in a low power envelope. They can also take over the easier background tasks, freeing up more performance on those P cores to improve your time on the machine. It's a neat idea, and mobile phones have been doing something remarkably similar for years now, but this is a fairly new concept on the desktop PC, and it's certainly had a few teething problems. Problems. Topping all of this off is a generous amount of L2 and L3 cache, 20 megs of L3 and a total 9.5 megs of L2 and wrapped up in a processor with a TDP rating of 65 watts. The current setup of this PC is modest but capable nonetheless, a Gigabyte H610M DDR4 motherboard with 32 gigs of DDR4 2666MHz RAM and admittedly suboptimal speed but what I had going spare at the time, powered by a Zotac GeForce RTX 3060 and an AeroCore integrated 600 watt power unit. As a side note you could also consider this a review of the RTX 3060 as it's the first time I've run that through testing as well. All games tested today are ran from an NVMe or SSD drive unless expressly stated. I use data pulled from a minimum of 10 minutes of actual playtime, although this is often longer. Without further delay, let's begin. Fallout 4 starts the lineup as always today at 1080p and using the Ultra Preter. Fallout 4 was an absolutely flawless experience that hit 60 FPS and stuck to it like glue. It looks great and it plays great too. Average was 59.9 FPS with percentile figures being 1% at 58.8 and 0.1% at 44.5. So it was very consistent in its overall delivery as well. Dying Light 2 was another outstanding performer. At 1080p and using a mixture of medium and high settings, zombie infested Villador looked great and it was fluid in motion too, so you're going to have a really enjoyable experience on the 14400F. Average was an outstanding 95.9, with 1.1% being 67 and 32.5 FPS respectively. It was overall a great experience, and I really enjoyed my time on this. We returned to the Wild West in Red Dead Redemption 2, at 1080p and using the game's high preset, but with ultra textures. Red Dead 2 was, like Fallout 4, almost flawless in its delivery on the 14400F and RTX 3060 combo, while the average was 81.3 FPS, there's a special mention needed here for all of those important percentile figures, which were absolutely fantastic. 1% was 63.4, with 0.1% being not far behind at 57.6, so you're in for a real treat here. Fight like hell in Doom the Dark Ages, which also performed really well. I posted a long form video of this last week, so go check it out if you want to see extended performance. But at 1080p and using a medium preset with DLSS set to balanced, the 14400F and RTX 3060 managed to absolutely slay you, those frame rates to live for a great time, that was awful. <laughs> Average was 78.2, with 1% hitting 62.1 and 0.1 at 48.7. Super. Oblivion Remastered is next. At 1080p and using the high preset with DLSS set to balanced, we saw an excellent average 73.8 FPS, but the percentile figures seem to be off here. In review, I captured approximately 24 minutes of data here, while I had a great time, 
a few other percentile figures have been skewed by loading through the Imperial City. I'm including these figures for posterity, but I will retest this as soon as I get a spare moment, as I believe these percentile figures seem off. 1% was just 0.7, with 0.1 being 0.6. Cyberpunk 2077 makes its first appearance on testing today. At 1080p and using the game's high preset DLSS set to balanced, the RTX 3060 managed a respectable average of 69.1 FPS during the entirety of the pickup mission. Outside areas would see a slight drop, but the game remains more than playable at good visual quality. 1% low was 50, and 0.1% was 37, both on the dot. The Dead Space remake also makes its first appearance. At 1080p using the high preset with DLSS enabled, Dead Space performed well enough but had some slight issues I have observed on other hardware and in other people's reviews. The remake is notorious for stuttering problems on some hardware, and while it wasn't game breaking, there were a number of occasions where the hitches were obvious. I've noted this problem on other hardware, and player reviews of the game on Steam also make mention of these issues even on more powerful computers than the one I have, so it's worth keeping in mind if you're thinking about revisiting the Ishimura on PC. Average was 103.1 with a respectable 1% low of 52.3, but the 0.1% was just 2.3. GTA 5 Enhanced is next. At 1080p and using the game's very high preset with DLSS enabled, the 14400F delivered an outstanding result in the same vein as Red Dead Redemption 2. It was a smooth, flawless experience with excellent percentile lows to go along with the 108.6 FPS average. 1% came in at a very good 71.6, with even the 0.1% figure almost hitting 60 frames, at 59.4. It was a great all-around result. A first again, Ship Graveyard Simulator 2. This is a game that certainly isn't well optimised, and brings even more powerful PCs a hard time with so much for everything to juggle. At 1080p and using the high preset, the 14400F and RTX 3060 managed absolutely fine overall, although there was the occasional stutter which is reflected in the percentile figures. Average was a plenty playable 102.8, with the 1% coming in at a decent 53.2 and the 0.1% coming in at a little low 11.5. It runs well, but there are some optimization related issues here. We're riding through the apocalypse in Days Gone now, a criminally underrated game in my opinion. We're using a mixture of high and very high settings here at 1080p and it was just an absolutely flawless experience overall. It looked great, it ran great and I honestly lost track of time while I was putting this through its paces. It's just that good. Average was a super 127 on the dot with excellent percentile lows too. 1% at 74.2 and 0.1% at a Still solid 44.9. Another console port, Horizon Forbidden West is our penultimate game today. At 1080p medium, we had to tweak a little to hit that magic 60fps mark, but that's what we ended up with. Frame rate target was set to 60fps, and using DLSS set to balanced, the RTX 3060 reached an average of 72.5, with decent enough percentile lows seeing us through a good time at 47.4 and 22.3 FPS, 1% and 0.1% lows respectively. Forbidden West is certainly a great looking game, and you don't really have to compromise too much to reach excellent results on budget hardware. And finally, Quake 2 RTX dropping in here to finish off the main testing today. At the default settings, we saw an excellent return of 75.9 FPS average, even with very high GPU usage, ray tracing usually demands from cards especially RTX showcases like Quake. The 14400F had no problems keeping up with Quake or anything else actually today, and its performance here was perfect too. 1% low was 62.3, and the 0.1% low I believe was skewered by a loading screen at just 1.4 FPS. But as you can see here, Quake 2 RTX had no issues here whatsoever, and that's a wrap. <laughs>I was a little sad to see my trusty i3 14100F go. Since purchase, it has been utterly reliable, and the high clock speeds of the little quad-core processor kept its performance up even when I dabbled in some fairly high-end gaming too. To me, it was a quad-core that could, so from that perspective, the i5 14400F has a lot to live up to. I usually try and keep my wrap-ups fairly straightforward, but we've got some things to discuss, and it's really difficult to surmise them in an oversimplified manner. I know that a lot of people really aren't fans of Intel right now, and I'm not saying that those criticisms are baseless either because they aren't. Many people, myself included, feel that something is off with Intel's CPU business right now, and they've had a shocking few years. And combined with the resurrection of AMD and Ryzen, the Intel of today doesn't seem like the unstoppable juggernaut of Intel of yesteryear. Although the i5 14400F has performed flawlessly in everything I have thrown at it, just like the i3 14100F it replaced, it has been a solid, reliable processor that delivers great performance for the £120 I picked it up for. 
£70 if I took the money I made back from the 14100F towards it, but it's not without some minor issues. Like the rest of Raptor Lake, these things run hot, and you'll certainly do it a service by investing in a cheap aftermarket cooler and contact plate like I have had to do to keep those temperatures down. These processors also seem hungrier than previous generations, with power consumption seemingly higher than previous generations of Intel's chips. Outside of my own personal experience, there's also something going off with 14th gen processors and processor instability. I have been fortunate enough to not have noticed anything off personally but enough people are having problems with processor stability on LGA 1700 that I do believe it should factor in your purchasing decisions. There's frankly far too many of these little things going on with Intel in general right now and as a result despite really liking both 14th gens that have occupied my desk it makes it really tricky for me to commit to a recommendation to you. As well as these issues pricing of these chips is also higher than they really ought to be for the performance offered and all of this is on a socket that is now effectively going nowhere too. It makes for a really tough sell. The Core i5-14400F is a solid performer overall, day-to-day -day tasks are easy, video editing is no sweat for it, and gaming is an excellent experience all around. It is a competent chip, but even if we discounted the aforementioned issues, its current pricing just feels a little too high. If you're already on LGA 1700 and you're looking for an upgrade from an earlier generation, Core i3 or Core i5, then I think it's worth the upgrade despite the price. If you're building new though, I think you'd be better served looking at a build based around AM5. Okay, and that's a wrap for today. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you liked it, please do consider liking the video. And if you're not already, also consider following me on Twitter. I'll put my handle in the video now. I've been Zonal Fair on the Tech Quest, and thank you very much for watching. Until next time, bye bye.